Thank you. Good evening to you. Coming up on BBC London. A Muslim student at a non-faith free school loses their High Court challenge against its ban on prayer rituals. We get reaction in Wembley. I don't think it's really good for, for the modern society. I mean, like, they might use it as a precedent and uh, where are we going to go from there? Like, uh, some people will not be happy at all with this. But the head of the free school describes the court's decision as a victory for all schools. Also tonight. Toxic Thames, that's how wildlife expert Steve Backshall has described the river after taking samples between the Bucks Barks border. Plus calls for the government to continue to provide free period products in schools and... Ready? Yeah, yeah let's go. Yeah, OK. Why the Londoner known as the Skipping Seek is running the marathon this weekend for a very personal reason. Hello and welcome to the programme. The state of the River Thames is once again in the spotlight. Since the start of the year, Thames water has discharged around 2,000 hours of sewage into the Greater London area. Along with regular users of the waterways, wildlife expert and TV presenter Steve Backshall has described pollution found in the river as toxic after he took samples from downstream from Little Marlow Sewage Treatment Works. Thames Water says all discharges from the site had been fully compliant with environmental law. Joe Campbell has the story. I've lived here now for 10 years, but I've been kayaking this stretch of the river for at least 25. And what's happened to it in recent years is absolutely heartbreaking. Steve Backshall's used to facing danger in the wild. But what he found here in his own backyard, after a nearby works discharged sewage into the river, he says for 16 hours, left him horrified. Had this been a sample done when I was taking my tests, uh, consuming that would put you in hospital without any question. And it's not an exaggeration to say that it, it could have killed you. The levels of E. coli, norovirus, enterovirus were so high that sometimes the lab technicians wouldn't even open the, uh, the samples that were sent to them. And, you know, they've described it as being a death potion for the river, something that could kill anything living in or near to the river. As an honorary lecturer at Bangor University, he got the team there to put the Thames under the microscope. I would love to say that these results were a surprise, um, but we are finding that when we have samples um, from an area that has had a sewage spill, we are seeing poor quality water like this. Um, I was surprised at just how high um, some of the readings were from Steve's samples, um, but unfortunately um, it is it is becoming all too common. For Steve, who's traversed the river with his Olympic medal-winning wife, Helen Glover, Ready? and now yep. takes their children on the water, it was a shock. So right now, I wouldn't go in the river. And then there's the thought that, you know, there are people walking their dogs along the banks, there are kids splashing around in the water, my own kids. Uh, and, you know, they could get seriously, seriously ill from this. Steve's sampling methods have been questioned by Thames Water. Today, they were inviting him to a private tour of their nearby site, which they say meets all the required standards, whatever his test showed. Joe Campbell, BBC London. And uh, we can get the latest now from broadcaster and naturalist Steve Backshall now. Good evening to you, Steve. As we heard there, you were invited by Thames Water to visit Little Marlow Sewage Treatment Works today. Uh, did they address your concerns? Um, well, well, first off, I have to pick up on a couple of things from, from your package there. You said that Thames Water questioned my collection methods, and I, I spent three hours with them today, and they absolutely didn't question at all. In fact, actually, they said that what I had come back with was kind of what they would expect. Um, and a lot of the things that were said, actually, in my conversations with them today, I, I found quite shocking. You know, they sort of said that, A, it's not their business to tell us whether it's safe to be in the river behind us. That, that is completely up to us. But at the same time, the Thames is not safe to swim in generally, even, uh, you know, not thinking about after sewage outages. It's 
generally not safe to swim in because of effluent from um, from sewage treatment. And I, I kind of felt it was amazing that they were prepared to take me and local residents in and they were to be able mm. to be so transparent with us. But at the same time, a lot of the things they said were pretty shocking. Mm. And, and we, of course, did ask Thames Water if they would talk to us tonight, as we have done on many, many occasions, but they declined. Um, but as, as you've said, you know, they do say that Little Marlow Sewage Treatment Works is fully compliant within the law and the site is due to be upgraded. Uh, they didn't mention any upgrades today. In fact, they were specifically asked about those and they said that they had no plans for them. Um, uh, also, you Sorry, said that... Sorry, so they specifically I... said to you, Steve, that they have no plans for the site to that, be upgraded? That, was, that question was asked and they said, uh, we we have no information on that at present. Um, also, you said that it was it was me that said there were 16-hour outages. That has come from Thames Water. So they've had three so far this year, the longest of which was 16 and a half hours. Um, my testing was taken about 24 hours after the 12-hour outage here. Mm -hmm. And some of the, the, the figures there, you know, we have norovirus at levels way, way above mm -hmm. what it would need for you to get sick from, from being close yeah. to the water. Uh, you know, know, it only needs to be 10... Sorry, carry on. No, no, no. Uh, and we know so, so many people are, are, are concerned about this. Can I ask you just very briefly, given your, your talks with them this afternoon and, and what you, you've learned, you know, what would you like to see now from Thames Water? Well, one productive thing that we did uh, kind of come to was that a lot of the residents said they would they would just like to know, you know, it, Thames Water is aware that they're putting these kind of pathogens into the river, that if it's happening, that there should be local alerts, that we should be, you know, given the opportunity to, to say to our kids, don't go near the river for the next couple of days because, you, you know, there's massive loads of E. coli and norovirus and terovirus in there that could make you sick. And they, they seemed on board with that, but it, it remains to be seen whether there'll be any developments there. OK, and of course, we will keep across this as well. Steve, thank you so much uh, for joining us this evening here on BBC London. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Let's turn now to the race for City Hall as Londoners vote for our next mayor in just over two weeks' time. By the way, today is the final day to register to vote in the local elections on the 2nd of May. Anyone who's not registered has until midnight tonight to apply. Meanwhile, campaigning continues apace. And today it was the turn of the Lib Dem candidate, Rob Blackie, to outline what he'd do if he were elected mayor. Our political editor, Tim Donovan, was there. At a boxing gym in South London, the Liberal Democrat leader had a jab at mayor and government. People do not want to vote Conservative in our great city and they're looking for an alternative to, to, to the mayor. The mayor has let people down and people do, are not going to vote for Sadiq Khan. He is the only main candidate saying he won't freeze transport fares, so he has money for other priorities. It's going to cost £60 million and it will benefit tourists with no gain for ordinary Londoners who have a travel card. I will cancel that plan, and over four years I will invest that money elsewhere. That will free up the equivalent of at least 300 officers to focus on sexual offences and other serious crimes. Among other pledges, he would allow people to apply for ULES money retrospectively if they've already scrapped their vehicle. He would create a fund to help tenants in legal dispute with their landlords. And his key promise is to double the clear-up rate for sexual assaults. You make it sound like it's ambitious uh, to double the rate of clear-up, but what you would be doing, all you'd be doing, is getting back to what it was in 2016, by your own admission. Well, we've been left a huge mess by the mayor, so it will take some time to clear up that mess. Our ambition is obviously to go further. With London such a popular destination, he also wants a voluntary tourist tax. What have you got against tourists? <laughs> I think tourists are fantastic. And if we, because we can make our city brilliant, that means they can contribute a little bit back. As you say, it would be voluntary. We haven't banked any of that money. Any money we do get will go straight into the police. Over the last three elections, the Lib Dems have finished fourth behind the Greens. At the very least, they'd like to win that bout. And we can speak to Tim now. Uh, Tim, because the first of the mayoral debates between the main candidates was this evening. 
Yeah, the first time uh, that the uh, main candidates have been in a TV or radio studio debating together on uh, ITV News in the last uh, hour. Uh, Sadiq Khan said he was proud of his record and proud of uh, freezing Transport for London fares uh, next year and putting money into free school meals, while his Tory opponent, uh, Susan Hall, said a lot of money was wasted and attacked uh, Sadiq Khan's record in particular on policing and crime and said she'd want to bring back borough policing. But Riz, there was one particular clash about whether or what charges motorists could face in the future. Today, Sadiq Khan's team said they were complaining to the Crown Prosecution Service about leaflets the Conservatives have delivered, uh, saying that Sadiq Khan has plans to charge motorists according to the distance they travel. It's called Paper Mile. And uh, Susan Hall was asked about that straight away this evening. Sadiq Khan says he's not going to bring in Paper Mile. But Sadiq Khan also said he would never bring in the ULOS expansion. And look what happened there. And that has caused so much hardship for families that simply cannot afford to replace their cars. If they think that is bad enough, if we bring in Paper Mile or if Sadiq Khan brings in Paper Mile, everybody will be paying. It's, it is uh, untrue. Uh, what I'm passionate about is continuing to improve public transport in London. London has benefited with a first freeze in five of the last eight years, the Hopper Fare, unlimited bus travel for an hour and also with the tram, the cheapest bus fares in the uh, country. What I want to do if I'm re-elected is to make sure all our buses are zero emission. We already have the largest electric bus mm -hmm. fleet in Europe. Sadiq Khan has held out the prospect of a Labour mayor working with a Labour government. Susan Hall says she'd uh, work uh, with anyone and work with anyone uh, effectively. As to the others, uh, Rob Blackie uh, repeated for the Liberal Democrats that he wants a long-term funding deal and, and wouldn't have a fares freeze, while Zoe Garbit for the Greens has promised to kind of restore confidence uh, in the police, particularly among uh, some communities. She wants to introduce a flat fare across the underground, whether you're in Zone 6 or, or Zone 2, wherever you're going, you'd um, uh, uh, pay the same. And is hoping that there'll be more attention on housing, on, on rental sector in particular, as someone who rents herself. OK, Tim, for now, many thanks. That's our political editor, Tim Donovan. Uh, lots to digest, and so in the run-up to Election Day on the 2nd of May, we've asked the candidates in the race for the capital's top job to summarise their manifestos in 60 seconds. Tonight, it's the turn of Howard Cox, the Reform UK Party candidate, to give us his pitch. My name is Howard Cox. I'm standing for Mayor for the Reform UK Party. There are three major policies that I'm actually focusing on. The first one is actually to re reduce violent crime. And this would mean tripling the number of bobbies on the beat and also uh, introducing intelligent-led intelligent le stop and search. One of the big things for me, of course, is and why I've been asked to stand by the Reform Party is because of my close association with motorists and drivers for the last 15 years. We must get rid of ULES, all of ULES, not just the ULES up to the M25, but the whole of, we must scrap ULES right across the capital. I also want to get rid of other anti-driver uh, policies introduced by this mayor, including LTNs, 20 mile an hour limits, speed bumps, pinch points, you name it, all the things that black cab drivers hate. And the final one, of course, is that uh, affordable housing. We just do not seem to have the affordable housing that was promised by this current mayor. And I will guarantee that I will triple the number of affordable housing, particularly on TfL land. That was Reform UK Party candidate Howard Cox. Uh, for more on the other candidates vying for the top job at City Hall, you can just scan the QR code uh, you can see on your screen uh, and you can see the 13 people standing to be London's next mayor. And if you head to the BBC London website, you can also find plenty more on the mayoral election and, of course, issues that matter to voters. More now on that High Court decision today to uphold a ban on prayer rituals at a London school. The Michaela Community School in Wembley introduced a ban last year. One of its Muslim pupils brought the legal challenge, arguing the move discriminated against Muslim students. Alpa Patel has been getting reaction to the decision in Brent. Was banning prayer at the Michaela School in Wembley in breach of a Muslim student's right to religious freedom? No, a judge has ruled today. In Brent, this was the response of people we spoke to. I think there will be a lot of, um, a lot of anger, like disappointment, because in a school that's in the middle of Wembley, so many different cultures, ethnicities, religions, um, I think it's wrong. 
I don't think it's really good for, for the modern society. I mean, like, they might use it as a precedent and uh, where are we going to go from there? Like, uh, some people will not be happy at all with this. We met Yasmin and Leila, who wanted to remain anonymous. The school says that it's a secular school and that they cannot accommodate a prayer room because it's in an old office building. What do you think of those arguments? In my school, we didn't have a prayer room. We used to do it in our teachers' classrooms during break time because no one's teaching during those times. I felt like I was being valued and my religion was being respected. It felt nice. I think it is quite disappointing and they should really be encouraging everyone to, you know, show their faith comfortably and respectfully. But the head teacher of the Michaela School, where half these 700 students are Muslim, says the judgment is a victory. In a statement, Catherine Burble Singh says a school should be free to do what is right for the pupils it serves. She added, if parents do not like what Michaela is, they do not need to send their children to us. In the past, she has said, ours is a happy and respectful secular school where every race, faith and group understands self-sacrifice for the betterment of the whole. Suella Braverman, a former governor at the school, agrees. I think it's absolutely essential that if we are going to have secular schools, if we're going to live in a successful multi-ethnic, multi-faith, multicultural society, we need to have cohesion around common values, British values. Those children are British citizens. The secondary school gets excellent results and is oversubscribed. The Muslim student who brought this case has said she is disappointed with the judgment. This case has provoked strong feelings on both sides. Some commentators say it does provide schools with some direction on a sensitive issue. By the ruling being made that it was lawful, it means that for head teachers things are far more straightforward. They can make the decisions that they feel are right for their school and they've got the freedom to do that. Today's judgment will be looked at closely by other schools who may choose to review their own policies in the future. That report by Alpha Patel and you can see more on that story and reaction on our website of course. Now, charities are calling for the government to continue providing free period products in schools. The scheme is due to end in July and they haven't confirmed if it will be extended. Campaigners say demand for products will continue to rise due to the cost of living crisis. Lakshmi Gopal has more. Packing up period products is part of a service that's vital for many, though goes unseen by most. How many more do you need? Alvina Appleton set up Flow Happy after struggling with the cost of sanitary items herself. I was in uni, I became pregnant and I couldn't afford the basic necessities. Um, so I understand what it's like to not have the basic necessities available to me. Um, and when my circumstances change, I thought, you know, I want to make a difference. Her organisation, funded by donors, distributes period products for free to community centres, workplaces and libraries. It's a service that in an ideal world it wouldn't be provided, um, but it is. And as, as research shows, um, anecdotally as well, the demand is so high and we're trying to meet it. Um, and I think it is very important in that sense. Today, they're heading to North Kensington Library to refill their stock. The government has provided free period products to schools since 2020, but the scheme is due to end in July and charities are worried. Period products are a necessary item. We can't choose whether to have periods or not. Particularly young people and people who are in school need access to vital products. We actually know that three million days are lost per year at school due to periods and young people not being able to access the care that they need. So it is vital that this scheme is not only kept in place, but actually improved. They should be expanding their services. I don't think children in school should have to go to the office to ask for products. I believe that they should be in the bathrooms. Um, I believe they need to be in more public places. So, you know, it's, it's very disheartening. The Department for Education didn't respond directly to the question of whether it would continue the scheme beyond July, but it said any extension of it would be confirmed in due course.
If it isn't extended, Alvina fears services like hers may not be able to meet demand and it could mean a step backwards in the fight against period poverty. Lakshmi Gopal, BBC London. To one of our marathon stories now and the Londoner known as the Skipping Sikh. Rajinder Singh from Hayes is running for a very personal reason to raise awareness of a rare cancer his wife has been diagnosed with. He's one of thousands preparing to run or wheel the 26.2 miles through the streets of the capital this weekend in what is the world's largest annual fundraising event. Chris Legg can tell us more. I'm Arjinder Singh. They call me Skipping Sikh. I learned this uh, from my father as he was Second World War soldier. Four years ago, with the country locked down, Rajinder Singh became a skipping sensation. His videos inspired thousands. He raised thousands for the NHS and was later awarded an MBE. He's since run three London marathons. This Sunday, with daughter and BBC journalist Minreet by his side, he'll tackle the course for a fourth time. It's an inspiration for me, seriously. I, you know, I don't know what to say. He's like nearly double my age and I'm running with my dad. I mean, that's just amazing. If I can keep up with him, brilliant. If I can't, well, you know what? At least we did the marathon together. They're running to raise awareness of myeloma, a rare cancer that Rajinder's wife, Pritpal, was diagnosed with last year. My treatment was very, very hard. I was so tired all the time. I was sleeping all the time. It's not me. It's not me. I just want to come out of this and be the same person I was there before. When my mum got diagnosed and the doctor said, this is what you have, you know, I, I remember that moment. You know, for me, I felt like, you know, I felt like my life had turned upside down. Through Rajinda's skipping and running, the family has found hope in tough times and want to comfort others dealing with serious illness. It's a very difficult living when any person sick in a family your mind is always there, even you're doing other things as well. I try my best to show people, please don't give up. No one is perfect. When you're sick, do your best and look after each other. Ready? Yeah, yeah let's go. Yeah. OK. A philosophy which perfectly embodies the spirit of the London Marathon. Chris Slegg, BBC London. He certainly does embody the spirit of the London Marathon. Good luck to everybody running. Five days to go and you can follow all the marathon coverage on the day live on BBC Radio London uh, from nine o'clock on Sunday morning. We've got reporters all along the route. Uh, you can also listen on BBC Sounds. Right, let's get a check on this weather, shall we? Uh, Sarah Thornton's joined us with all we need to know. Well, you're smiling, so that's a good start. Well, I was sort of <laughs> picturing people running in the weather that we'd had today. And what is it? The kitchen sink, the lightning, the <laughs> yeah, hail, all, all of that. Of things. It should be a little bit calmer for them by Sunday, I'm pleased to say. A little bit warmer as well for the spectators. That'll be good news. But in the meantime, of course, today has been a classic April day of sunshine and some heavy showers and quite a keen northwesterly wind as well. So it has felt quite chilly out there. Here's just one of the Weather Watchers pictures showing us, yeah, some sunshine, some blue sky, also the very black cloud. And eventually we got some lines of uh, thundery showers this afternoon. Here's one of the biggest, blackest clouds that we saw coming through from our Weather Watchers. And we've still got a bit more of that to go for tomorrow. For instance, we do have further showers in the forecast. But as I say, by the weekend, it is looking an awful lot drier and brighter. For the time being, though, we have got this northwesterly wind still feeding showers at through the day tomorrow. Then high pressures building in from the west through the weekend, which is what's going to make us more settled. Still a couple of days, though, of some cloudy conditions at the end of the week. But for the time being, a few showers around, then they tend to fade away overnight tonight. And the winds do drop out a little bit, which means the temperatures can take a tumble. Out in our suburbs, two or three degrees. It's going to feel pretty nippy tomorrow morning and the following morning as well, as we keep that slightly colder air with us. And at first, tomorrow, it's dry with some lovely sunshine, but then we'll see those northwestern 
westerly winds start to bring in some showers. Potentially there are fewer than today, but equally you're a better chance of seeing them if you're further east, whereas a lot of the today's showers were out towards the west. And then again, they fade tomorrow night and into the start of things on Thursday. It is a chilly start. Then we start to bring in more cloud, but you might be able to see here with the wind streams that we're slightly changing the wind direction. That means the temperatures are coming up a little bit. 14 Celsius, 57 in Fahrenheit. Not bad when you're in the sunshine. And then on the air mass chart, you can start to see, having lost a little weak cold front on Friday morning, that the oranges appear from the west as the high pressure builds in. So that means things are going to turn A, more settled, and be quite a bit warmer too. But still some work to do. As I say, tomorrow morning and certainly on Thursday morning, it's going to be a chilly old start for you. A little bit of ground frost out there towards our suburbs. And then tomorrow after a dry and sunny start, we'll see their showers feeding back towards us in the afternoon. And like today, they could have some hail, thunder and lightning mixed in with them. But there will be some sunshine around. It looks like we're going to have quite a bit of cloud at the end of the week, a weak cold front bringing us that. But as I say, things turn warmer and more settled, certainly by Sunday. I love the enthusiasm, yeah. Sarah. Thank you. And it stays lighter longer. <laughs> and that is it this Tuesday. So thanks very much for watching. You know you can find plenty more on our website and social media, including more of our marathon stories. From all the team, do have a lovely evening. Bye-bye.